On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fits and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats. So they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had just taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Now, you know how parents always bang on about their children. Uh, I must admit, I'm a bit guilty of that as well. How about I do the reverse? How about I bang on a bit about my parents? (laughs) I gave you the photo there of my dad in the 80s, but here's a bit more of the backstory. My dad did not grow up in a Christian family. It wasn't until he got to university in Southampton that he met some Christians and started looking into the claims of the Christian faith. And he became convinced that they were true. He then made a big decision that would affect the rest of his life. He decided, together with my mum, because they were so convinced of Jesus' love for them and for others, that they should dedicate their whole lives to telling other people about this. He decided to leave his university degree and that kind of career behind him, having studied engineering, and instead uh, became trained in kind of the, in the church and then moved out to Belgium as a missionary. Uh, that was in the 80s. By this point, they'd had four kids. I'm told the fourth one was particularly challenging. <laughs> and they moved out to Belgium to lead a church there. And what did that look like for them for roughly 30 years? Basically living on nearish the minimum wage and leading a small church of maybe 30, 40 people that at no point could be described as impressive. Would you say that was a wise career decision? You know, if one of your friends was asking you about that kind of career decision, would you advise them to do it or not? What if it was your child thinking about this decision? Well, this passage we just heard read finishes with these words, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. What do you make of those words? They left everything and followed him. It sounds probably a bit over the top, doesn't it? Well, this lunchtime, we're gonna investigate this together. We're gonna investigate what happened. I've got four points I'd like to draw out, and for each point, I'd like to also make a bit of a personal angle, tell you about my own journey. But we do need to start off by setting the scene. Where are we? Well, here we are by the lake of Gennesaret, the Lake of Galilee. You see that in verse one. And you can see that the crowds are pressing in on him, on Jesus, because they've heard about these miracles. Uh, If you look to what happened just before in chapter four, people have been healed, many people have been healed. The word is spreading. Everyone wants a glimpse of this miracle worker. But Jesus wants to teach. And so with the crowds pressing in on him, what does he do? He's by the edge of of, of this lake. He asks for a boat, and that's where we first meet this character, Simon. And he asks to use the boat to be pushed out into the sea, a bit like a floating pulpit. Personally, I'm quite glad that this one is stable. Um, We meet Simon. He's also called Simon Peter, so I hope you don't find that confusing. But what's interesting is we don't get any of the teaching in this passage. We just get what comes after the teaching. So clearly there's a lot we need to be taught in what happens next. And that's my first point this lunchtime. The unreasonable demands of Jesus the unreasonable demands of Jesus. 
Do you see what happens? As soon as Jesus has finished his lecture, his teaching, what does he say in verse four? He says to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Put yourself in Simon's shoes for a minute. Maybe we should say Simon's sandals. How would you feel if you heard these words from Jesus? I think you'd probably feel mildly exasperated. You know, it's a bit like a clash of the trades. Jesus, carpenter, tells Simon, fisherman, how to do his job. Have you ever had that in your workplace when someone comes in from a different department and pretends they know how to do your job for you? You just tell them to kind of back off. You get really frustrated. I know what I'm doing. Jesus is also being insensitive because Simon tells us he's been up all night and caught nothing. Also, you could say Jesus is being actually irrational because at that time, uh, you would not fish in the deep because apparently there were fewer fish there. You'd fish near the shore and you would never do it in the daytime because the fish can see your nets. So Jesus is being insensitive. He's being irrational. He's unqualified. He's being unreasonable, isn't he? How does Simon respond? Look at verse five with me. Simon says, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. It's interesting that, isn't it? Pushback. We've been up all night, we caught nothing, but obedience. At your word, I will. That's a good lesson there for the Christian, actually. Sometimes we find what the Bible teaches difficult. We push back, but submission. We'll come back to that a bit later. And what happens then when Simon does follow through and obey Jesus' command, these seemingly unreasonable requests? Well, look at what happens in the story. He catches a ton of fish, doesn't he? Almost literally. Look at what happens in verse six and seven. When they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. It's really quite amazing what's happened, isn't it? It's miraculous. Now, there's bound to be people in this room, once they hear the word miraculous, they kind of switch off. They think it's just not possible. If that's you, let me ask you to consider a few things. Firstly, look at Simon's reaction. He doesn't react as if this is just a kind of lucky strike. What is he doing in verse eight? He falls down at Jesus' knees in adoration. Also, look at the amount of detail included. I just read out verses six and seven. The number of uh, of, of boats involved, the number of witnesses. You can see so much evidence gathered, easily falsifiable. As we've been going through Luke's gospel, we've got names of places, people, times, clearly recorded as history. And that is what Luke, the author of this account, tells us he's up to. In chapter one, he says, That is exactly why he's writing this account, so that we may have certainty of the things that have been taught. Now, if you're still not convinced, I would ask you to at least consider the fact that the people who wrote these accounts, who supposedly made them up, they all went and suffered or even died defending these claims as true. Now, if you write, you make up a myth and you do really well out of it, you probably perpetuate it. But the minute you start suffering for it, you get up, end up in prison, or threat to your life, you would immediately renounce that lie you made up. And yet these men stuck with the story. Would they really make it up? I'm persuaded that what's recorded here really happened, a miraculous catch of fish. And that actually changes things, doesn't it? Because we're saying our first point is the unreasonable demands of Jesus. It's actually unreasonable in inverted commas. That's really important because there's nothing unreasonable at all about what Jesus actually asked when you see who he, who he really is, when you see his identity. Now, if you think the miracle is surprising, and I think it is, what comes next is equally, if not more, surprising. Do you see what Simon's reaction is after he catches the fish? We said he falls on his knees. Do you see also that he's addressing Jesus differently? Look at, with me at verse eight. He says, O oh Lord, when he's talking to Jesus. He was calling him master earlier on in this story, and now he's calling him Lord. Master would be a term of respect for a teacher or a rabbi. Now he's calling him Lord. Actually, the word Lord has come up about 30 times already in Luke's account, and we're only four chapters in. 
And every time it refers to the Lord God. Could Simon actually be saying that he's in the presence of a divine being? That's absolutely what he's saying. And what else does he say? And what would you expect Simon to say? You know, he's been exposed as uh, having got this one wrong. You'd expect him maybe to say, sorry, Jesus, you were right. I shouldn't have doubted you. Or maybe even um, a lousy fisherman. Or I think if he was a city worker, he'd probably say, Jesus, do you want a job? (laughs) Um, We could do with a few guys like you around here to kind of meet our targets. But no, that's not what he says at all. Please look down at verse 8, see what he says. He says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, what's that got to do with it? I think that's what we're left thinking. What has that got to do with it? And that's our second point this lunchtime on your sheet. The insight Jesus brings, the insight Jesus brings. He says, get away from me, for I am a sinner. What do we mean when we say a sinner? It is worth defining these things because many people would define sin as you know, having too many chocolates and indulging in something like that. No, in the Bible, sin is rejecting God, rejecting God, God's rightful rule over our lives. My wife puts it this way. She only became a Christian uh, when she was around 18. She said that until that moment, she realized she'd basically been ignoring God and shaking her fist at him. That's sin. Not primarily the bad things we do, but primarily an attitude of ignoring and rejecting God. And that is then expressed in a whole series of ways of what we do say and think. Simon acknowledges his sinfulness. Do we? Do we? You know, people often ask for the evidence for Jesus. I think we should spend as much time asking what the evidence for us says. What does the evidence for you say? What does the evidence for me say? Well, I'll start with me. Throughout my whole life, I've consistently failed to meet my own standards, morally, ethically, let alone God's standards. I wonder if you're the same. Even as a young child, I would always get into trouble. I remember a time where I stole money from my dad's money pot and felt deep shame at what I'd done. As a teenager, I'd often think, I'm not surprised that my friends at school are not interested in finding out more about the Christian faith because I myself am a bad advert for this product. I'm a hypocrite. I say one thing and live a very different way. Lying, letting people down, answering back to the teachers. Deep shame. And still today, the same thing applies. Every day of my life, I reveal to myself my own selfishness in my actions, my thoughts, hurting people, usually people closest to me, like my wife, in the things I say, the way I behave. And I suspect you're the same. I mean, all of us are very good at putting on a front and hiding this stuff and looking respectable, but deep down, we know the truth. And if this is new for you today, I know it's not a popular view, but it is what the Bible teaches. It's what Jesus teaches. We know we all do things wrong, and many of us feel that shame for these things we've done wrong and we keep doing wrong. But actually, the Bible tells us it's much worse than just shame. It's actually guilt. Guilt before a holy God. We're all in trouble before a holy God. So what's going to happen if Simon is addressing Jesus as Lord? What's going to happen when you acknowledge your sinful state to Jesus? Well, that's another massive surprise. It's a good surprise. And that's our third point this lunchtime. Jesus welcomes inadequate failures and gives them work to do. Jesus welcomes inadequate failures, and he gives them work to do. You know, you're on the edge of your seat when you see Simon's confession. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. What's Jesus going to say? Verse 10, Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Let me just lay out two things Jesus doesn't do. You know, Simon acknowledges his failing, his sinfulness. What does Jesus not do? Jesus doesn't disagree with his self-assessment. You know what we would probably do? We'd probably say, hey, don't be too hard on yourself, Simon. You're a great guy. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't disagree with our self-assessment when we say, I'm a sinful man. But Jesus also doesn't change change track. He doesn't say, oh, well, in that case, I'll have to pick someone else. I don't know if you've ever had that at work. I know I have. When someone picks you for a kind of high-profile project and you lay out all the reasons why you're not qualified, you know, I've never worked in that country with these people, that language... And as you're laying out your reasons, you can tell they're changing their mind. And they're thinking, gosh, we need to pick someone else, actually. 
and you feel rubbish, you feel inadequate. Jesus doesn't do that. When you lay out your reasons for being inadequate, Jesus says, you're fully qualified to join my team. It's a wonderful thing. The minute you acknowledge who Jesus is, Lord, and you acknowledge who you are, a sinner, then you're welcome in the club. And that takes us to the very core of the Christian message. And I think it's something many of us get wrong, actually. We think the Christian message is basically do good, earn enough points with God, and you might get into his good books. Actually, that's not the Christian message at all. The Christian message is Jesus is Lord. I'm a sinner. Jesus, later on in Luke's gospel, will go to die on the cross for us, to win for us a restored relationship with God that starts now and lasts into eternity. If only we will turn to him as our king. Will we do that? Now, if this is brand new to you, please do investigate this. Maybe make that the task of the summer, to look into this for yourself. Maybe take away that Luke's gospel and keep reading it. Ask questions. Is this really true that this is what the Christian message is about? But back to our story. I just love the fact that Jesus has work for inadequate failures to do. And what is that work? Well, it's to spread the word, isn't it? Do you see that cryptic phrase he uses? From now on, you'll be catching men. Actually, in the Greek, that word men is just men and women. I think he's using a phrase that Simon would be familiar with, catching fish, and now catching men. He's sort of saying, in the same way that there are loads of fish in this net, there will be loads of people coming into the kingdom, being saved, as you proclaim that word. And it's the same for us today, isn't it? If we're Christians here today, we have that same instruction to tell others. What a privilege that Jesus wants to involve us in this work. He doesn't just welcome us into the club, he does, but he also gives us work to do, to spread the word, not to hoard the message, but to share it with others. How do we feel about that? I think most of us find that difficult. We get quite nervous. Let me make it very honest and, uh, and personal. Uh, I actually stood as a local candidate in Brentwood, in my hometown, in 2015 for the Conservatives. No booing, please. And um, that, they told me at the time, the only, the only way you've got a chance of getting elected, really, is to knock on all the doors, meet everyone who lives on your patch. And you've got to knock on the doors twice, basically, because on average, half the time, people are out. Introduce yourself as the candidate, ask for their vote. That's how you do it. And I did it for basically 13 weeks. I spent every Saturday, eight or nine hours a day, knocking on those doors, inching my way around the map, every single door. And do you know what I had in my head quite a lot as I went round, uh, knocking on doors? I thought, how come you're prepared to knock on doors to tell people that you're a candidate for a local party and you want their vote, which you know in the grand scheme of things is not that important, and yet you're not prepared to tell those same people the good news about Jesus. Maybe you can empathize with that. Forget about knocking on doors. Even some of my friends or my neighbors might not know the message of Jesus. Maybe, like me, you use this kind of easy cop-out excuse, which is, you know, I'm not an evangelist. I think when we say that, we need to be honest with ourselves. What we mean is, I'm not an evangelist about Jesus. Because we're all very happy to rant and rave about stuff we're really passionate about. You know, we run into the office, we tell everyone about amazing film we watched or holiday we went on or how well our kids did at school or in exams. Jesus tells us here, our job is to go and spread the word, get involved in his mission. In the past couple of years over at Swiss Re, I've tried to care a little bit less about what people think of me and try and get a bit more on board with this and be more overt. And it can be scary at times when your finger is hovering over that send button to invite your whole team or your whole department to an event or to open the Bible to consider the claims of the Christian message. But it's amazing what God does when we do spread the word. I've seen in the last couple of years, people come to faith. I've seen people start investigating the Christian message. People make real progress in their Christian walk. Back to our story. How does it end? Just one verse left for us to look at, verse 11. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Is that reasonable? Is it over the top? You know, they left everything and followed him. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. These guys, they leave their family behind, their homes, their jobs. They actually leave a massive haul of fish on the beach, right? That's basically the retirement account sorted, and they leave it behind 
to follow Jesus because nothing's more important to them at that moment than being with Jesus. And they don't even seem to be doing it begrudgingly. Do you notice that? It's not kind of grumpy, or fine, I'd get, I best, better do it then. This is gladly following Jesus. What would make someone do that? Well, it's an encounter with Jesus, isn't it? And that's our fourth point this lunchtime. The reasonableness of following Jesus. The reasonableness of following Jesus. Is it irrational behavior to give up everything and follow Jesus? Well, if you ask Simon, he would say, in the light of what he saw, it's totally rational. Obviously, there's a perception out there, isn't there, that being a Christian is a leap of faith, a leap in the dark. But it's quite the opposite. They consider the evidence. They see it for themselves. We can do the same. We can consider the evidence. And they decide to follow him. I think Phil Grundy put it really well here two weeks ago. Do catch up on that talk if you missed it. He said he began to investigate the evidence about Jesus, and he came to the settled conviction that Jesus is who he says he is. So it is totally reasonable to follow Jesus. But how do we feel about the gave up everything part? Do you see that? They left everything and followed him. The followed him bit, we're probably on board with that. The gave up everything bit, that's a bit more difficult, isn't it? And it's really important here, almost like a kind of time out, to say that none of us get this right. Is, as a rem- you know, remember, I said it's not about earning brownie points with God. He has done it all for us. And in fact, if you need a, an encouragement in that, these guys didn't get it right. You know, it might look good here. They left everything and followed him. But by the time you get to Luke chapter 22 and the going gets tough, they leave Jesus and run. So nobody has got this right fully. In fact, the only reason we can give up anything to follow Jesus is because he first gave up everything for us. But we shouldn't miss the challenge of this story. These guys gave up everything to follow Jesus. How can we, if we're Christians here, follow Jesus in that kind of radical way? We're not told to necessarily give up our jobs, our homes, to follow Jesus, but we are told to put Jesus as our top priority and align everything else in behind that. Do we accept that challenge? Again, I'll make it personal. Uh, I was really inspired by a bunch of guys, especially a guy called Carl Porter, who cut down his hours to be able to do more work telling people about Jesus by opening the Bible with them. And that's why I've done the same since February. I've gone down to four days a week, trying to have a bit more time to do this sort of stuff, become a fisher of men, so to speak, sharing the good news about Jesus with others. And may I make an observation? Do you see what happens here? Simon, Peter, and the others, they give up everything to follow Jesus. I think many people, sadly, do the exact opposite. They give up Jesus to follow everything or anything. Here we see them give up everything to follow Jesus. Many people give up on Jesus and follow after anything and everything. Maybe they've heard about Jesus when they were a child or maybe through a colleague or maybe they came to St. Helens or another church. They open their Bibles and they think, no, I'll give up on Jesus. I'd rather chase after everything and anything. And the sad thing is, it doesn't satisfy, does it, ultimately? I think, again, we all know this if we're being honest. Maybe that's the position you're in today. You're searching for meaning in your job or your achievement, your career, your reputation, the bigger house you're hoping for, the perfect relationship you're dreaming of, or academic achievement of your kids, whatever it might be. I had a recent story, actually, a friend of mine had, had, had done, done quite a big house extension to her own house, and she went to visit another friend who had a bigger house, and when she was walking around that house with her friend, that friend kept talking about someone else who has a much bigger house. And I sat there thought to myself, it'll never be enough, will it? It'll never be enough. We know this deep down. Chasing after everything and anything for fulfillment and satisfaction, it doesn't satisfy But more importantly than that, it doesn't address our biggest need. We are still sinful men and women that need to be restored in our relationship with our creator. And Jesus offers that for us today. So if you're not a Christian here this lunchtime, you would say, no, follower of Jesus, that's not me. Maybe you came here this lunchtime thinking being a Christian, it's kind of a leap in the dark. It's an irrational thing to do. I hope this passage has at least challenged you to think again. Jesus made these seemingly unreasonable demands of Simon, 
But by the end of this short episode, Simon had seen enough to give up everything to follow Jesus. So do investigate this. And if you are a Christian, you do want to live as a follower of Jesus, and maybe you struggle with certain parts of Jesus' teaching, you find yourself naturally pushing back. Well, you're in good company here with Simon. You know, let's react a bit like Simon. I toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will obey. I will let down the nets. And Jesus gives us clear instructions in the Bible about how we are to shape our priorities, what to do with our money, how to behave in the areas of sex and moral ethics, how to treat our boss, and so on and so on. And we find ourselves saying to Jesus, but you just don't know how annoying my boss is. Or, but you don't know how attractive she is. Or so on and so on. And we need to learn to say like Simon, but at your word, I will. Maybe it's areas of evangelism that we just have so many reasons to push back. We need to learn to listen to Jesus and to obey him. I heard it put well recently that it's not the bits of the Bible I don't understand that I struggle with. It's the bits of the Bible I do understand that I struggle with. The passage we read finishes with these words. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Is that over the top? Is it unreasonable? Well, the main message from this lunchtime is that actually following Jesus, however much it may cost you, is absolutely the reasonable thing to do in light of the evidence about who Jesus is and the evidence about who you are and who I am. Following Jesus, however much it may cost you, is absolutely the reasonable and the wonderful thing to do in the light of the evidence of who he is and who we are. Is it reasonable to give up everything to follow Jesus? Well, ask Simon. He would say yes. Ask my parents. They would say yes. Ask me. I would say yes. Actually, dare I put it to you, that the unreasonable thing to do is not to follow Jesus. Now, I've put a few questions for discussion and reflection on your sheet there. Please continue the conversation now uh, with people around your tables, but let me close in a prayer. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that we can come to him with all our inadequacies, our failures and our sinfulness, and he welcomes us. Lord, please uh, help us to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, and for anyone here who doesn't yet follow Jesus, would they come to trust him as their Lord? Amen.